Hello, everybody, and welcome to the FCC Food and Beverage Report event. I am Darlene McBain, and I work on the Industry and Stakeholder Relations team here at FCC, and I'm happy to be your host for today's event. Thank you all for joining us here today. You are all an important part of Canada's food and beverage industry, so we welcome you and thank you for taking the time to join us. I am coming to you today from my home office in Montreal, Quebec, and I do want to acknowledge that Montreal is a traditional and unceded territory, territory of the Mohawk and Algonquin people, and it is a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Wherever we find ourselves today in Canada, we are on traditional Indigenous territories with rich traditions, stories, and histories that should be understood and honoured. And it is our commitment in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration to honor these people as vital contributors to our society and respect the diversity and strength of all the indigenous people across this country. Now, before I introduce you to our keynote speaker, I just wanted to let you know that this session will be recorded and a link will be sent out to everyone who is registered here today. So if you need to step away or if you want to re-listen or share this content with your business partners or colleagues, the presentation will be available to you in a few days. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, so you may drop in there in the chat any of the questions that you may have. Now let me introduce you to our speaker, and we are thrilled to have with us today JP Gervais. JP is the Vice President and Chief Economist at FCC, and he will be sharing with us the results of the Food and Beverage Report that has just been released today. The FCC Food and Beverage Report provides an annual look at the trends, the opportunities, and the risks for you, the Canadian and beverage manufacturers, in order to help you navigate your own businesses. JP will provide us with some analysis of the findings in the report, and discuss the key factors that we are monitoring in the industry. So JP, welcome, and I'll now hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Darlene, and uh, thanks to all of you that are watching this event and this program live. And if you're watching the recording, uh, thanks as well for joining us. So we have lots to cover. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to provide an overview of our food and beverage report 2023. The report's available on the FCC website at FCC.ca. You can go through the economics section of the website. So if you do FCC, FCC.ca slash economics, that should get you there. Um, a number of different paths and ways to get to the report. But I do think it's important to emphasize that I'm not going to be able to provide a detailed uh, overview of the report. There are tons of statistics forecasts, projections, data points that are that you'll find in the report. We provide a, an overview of the industry, but we also do a deep dive into eight sectors, uh, the food and beverage manufacturing industry. So uh, I encourage you to go, and if you hear something that sounds interesting, it, it, it probably is, and I would encourage you to go to the website and, and download a copy and, and look for what you are actually um, seeking in terms of information. So before I actually go through uh, the overview of the report, I'm going to bring up another slide. So if we can move to the next slide and talk about the macroeconomic context behind the food and beverage industry. I really do think that it matters and, and we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the economic environment because what you'll find in the economic environment actually drives some of the projections that you'll find in the report. And let's face it, I mean, some of the economic context has changed actually quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. So let's just take uh, five to 10 minutes to provide a brief overview of the, uh, the current environment and the current ec ec economic context. And, uh, and if you need more details, again, fcc.ca slash economics would be the place to go. So we, you know, the inflation was the number one topic in 2022, and I do think that, you know, inflation will remain a relevant topic. I'm not ready yet to say that this is going to be the one topic in 2023, but I do think it's still very relevant to talk about inflation. 
we still are facing elevated inflation, right? And overall inflation is down to 5.2%. Food inflation is slightly higher, or not slightly, is higher at 9.7%. It has come down a little bit. That's the reason why I was I had the word slightly in mind. But there are really two trends right now between food inflation and overall inflation. The battle against overall inflation is not done. Far from it. Um, go back two, three weeks ago, March 10, uh, the projection that we had for the Bank of Canada rate was that the Bank of Canada rate was going to remain where it's at right now till the end of the year, only towards the very end of the year, December of this year, that we were going to see the Bank of Canada cut its interest rate, its overnight rate by 25 basis points. Even if we do expect that the Canadian economy is going to slow down in 2023. Now, what happened in the last couple of weeks is that we've had a major bank failure in the US. Silicon Valley Bank was insolvent. And so the Federal Reserve in the US and federal authorities had to step in to prevent a crisis from happening. So the credit crisis was averted for now. Um, but right soon after we learn of this bank failure, markets, financial markets reacted very strongly. And if you look at all sorts of financial instruments and, and, and bond yields and so forth, you can infer what are the expectations of financial markets when it comes to the Bank of Canada rate or the rate of the Federal Reserve in the US? And soon as soon after the, the crisis hit and the bank failure was, was known, we've seen expectations for the overnight rate of the Bank of Canada drop significantly. In fact, markets were quick to price a 25 basis point cut in the Bank of Canada rate as soon as April followed by another 50 basis point uh, cut in, in June and another 25 basis point in July. So basically the overnight rate of the Bank of Canada falling from what's, where it's currently at by 1% one, by 1 and more later on in the year. I think this was an overreaction uh, since then. So that was right after we learned of the bank failure. So since then, and then we learn of the actions of the federal authorities in the US and so forth to prevent any type of domino type domino style effect, right? So that, you know, one crisis, one bank failures leads to another failure and so forth. Um, and so we, I think the US managed to avert a major credit contraction. And so we've seen the financial markets in some ways walk back some of the expectations that they had soon after that bank failure. And so now they're still pricing a rate cut as early as summer, but not as early as April and not as deep as uh, in terms of overall cuts for 2023, as deep as they had, you know, maybe 10 days ago. So um, in, in some ways, I do think the financial markets overreacted. Uh, when you think about it for all of 2022, financial markets underestimated the pace and the magnitude of the rate increase from the Bank of Canada that was needed to fight off inflation. And so the pendulum kind of swung back to uh, actually under or overestimating the rate cuts that will be necessary to you know, support the economy. Because the fear is that if we do have a major credit crunch in the economy, that this is gonna lead to lower and slower economic growth much weaker than what we currently or we anticipated about two weeks ago. I do think that the markets overreact. Um, we might, you know, we're in the process of, of, of reviewing everything. So we might actually look at our assumption of a rate cut from December and move it a little bit forward to September, let's say. But overall, I don't expect major swings in, in interest rates and borrowing costs. And the, the way that the financial markets, I might say that the way that the financial markets have reacted to what has been happening in the last couple of weeks might actually provide an opportunity to some businesses that were thinking about the possibility of locking down some rates for the long term. Well, given where bond yields are right now for five-year bonds and so forth, it might, just might be an opportunity for businesses to lock in uh, money for the long term at a lower rate than what was available two weeks ago. So that's something perhaps for businesses to think of. Now, the Canadian economy, even though I think that the financial markets overreacted, and we still have lots to learn about how this is going to play out. I do think that for now, it seems that we averted the major crisis. Um, but we, I do think that the Canadian economy is going to be slowing down in 2023. Are we going to see a recession? We'll see. I do think that the 
economic growth when it comes to gross domestic product or GDP is going to be weaker, maybe for two quarters. So we might uh, we might record a bit of a decline for two consecutive quarters, which would technically meet the definition of a recession. So we might see that. But the bottom line is that we're going to have slower consumer spending, right? Consumers, labor market are very strong. That's not a surprise to any business looking to hire. Wages are still going up year over year at a rate around 5%. Depending on the province, it might be a little bit higher, it might be a little bit lower, but overall around 5%. So that's year over year. And we, I just said that inflation is at 5%. Now, I think that there are strong, strong, strong signals that inflation will be down to 3%, which is the upper range of the Bank of Canada when it comes to inflation. So we'll hit 3% as early as summer. So early summer, maybe in June, maybe in July. So that's a, somewhat of a good news. The thing is that it's going to be really difficult afterwards to bring inflation down lower than 3%. So bring inflation down to 3 I think we got it. Bringing inflation down under 3 it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, if wages continue to grow at a rate of 5%, and inflation by mid-year, is at, is at around 3%, well, it means that consumers or, 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 or labor or workers overall are doing better, right? Their income is going up on average at a faster pace than inflation. But the one thing that we must not forget is that consumers have carried and accumulated quite a bit of debt, non-mortgage debt and mortgage debt, but non-mortgage debt, uh, in 2022, savings went down, mortgage debt went, non-mortgage debt went up. And so debt servicing costs for the average households in Canada are going to go up because of interest rates that have been moving up in 2022 and are going to remain elevated in 2023. So at the end of the day, I do think that the impact on the wallet of the consumers is going to be that the wall, those wallets are going to be tighter. Disposable income in terms of in, in real terms is going to be um, weaker. And that's going to lead consumers to make some choices and decisions that are different than what we've seen in previous years. And I think that's one of the takeaways when you think of the overall economic environment. Um, I must say that, you know, in 2022, it was all about inflation and how cost of production for food processors and beverage manufacturers went up. I think we are going to see a pivot in 2023. We're going to move from challenges when it comes to supply and production and the ability to produce at an affordable price point for businesses to challenges with demand. And consumers are going to look, and they've already started to do that. They are going to look for lower price options when it comes to food. And so depending on the sector, depending on within the sector, the products that you offer and so forth, um, there, there are going to be some impacts. I fear like sometimes we, we often say, um, that we're fortunate to be in an industry that's immune to economic fluctuations. And I kind of not like that. I don't really like that saying, because I, I think it's true in, in some part that, um, that we are fortunate as Canadians that for the most part, most of the Canadian population can eat what they need. Uh, we still have segments of the Canadian population that are food insecure. We don't want to underestimate that. And, and I, I do think that's an issue that we need to be looking at for sure. But for the most part, you know, Canadians can have access to a, a reliable supply of food at an affordable price point. Um, but having said that, it doesn't mean that consumers are going to make some, some changes and shifts in their food consumption basket. And I do think that's important to realize as we're going into 2023. All right, spend enough time talking about the overall economic context. I'm going to bring up the next slide and just to look at some uh, very broad uh, economic indicators. So first and foremost, if we look at the um, sales for food and beverage manufacturing, it went up 10.6% in 2022. So that's pretty good news. When we look at the, the, the value of what food and beverage manufacturers sold, it went up 10.6%. Now, one of the issues is that Behind that 10.6% increase in value, there are two things going on. There are prices that have been moving up because we've seen our cost of production go up. So we've tried our best to actually pass on some of those higher costs, find some savings, find some efficiencies so that we can pass this through consumers. Uh, so if inflation has been really high, that means that volume of sales have not gone up by that much, right? In fact, if you look at the index of volume sold by food manufacturers and beverage manufacturers, it's been up going up 
1%. So mostly the increase in sales that we've seen is a result of, of inflation, inflation in cost, that then you know, carried over to, to inflation in, in, in prices when we sell to retailers and in some cases directly to consumers. The second thing I'd, be, uh, I'd like to point out in this particular slide is, is the value, the increase in the value of exports versus the increase in the value of imports. Our exports went up almost 14%, again, driven mostly by inflation that we've seen in prices, you know, and that was true in Canada, and that was true in, in, in the world in export markets. But we also saw imports go up at a rate of 18.2%, which is interesting because, you know, value, the value of imports going fast, up faster than the value of exports means that our trade balance shrunk. And, and, and in some ways, which I think is, is also something to point out is, that for all of 2020 and 2021, where consumers in Canada were quite um, receptive to buying local and were quite sensitive to local food trends, I think some of that kind of dissipated a little bit throughout 2022. And I think it's, there's a good reason why. I don't think that consumers want to eat less local. I think it's more of a economics that matters, right? And, and the economics is such that maybe... You know, it was, you know, in some cases, you know, those import uh, food products were a little bit cheaper than what you'd find in the Canadian market because of being of lower quality, among other things. So um, I do think that's a theme that you're likely to find again uh, in 2023. One of the things is that, uh, you know, and, and there are many factors that go into the decisions of buying local versus any other type of food products, but uh, price points certainly is always at the top. And then when we have a situation where we have lots of inflation, we got interest rates going up, so Canadian households see their, the cost of living go up without really just being able to, to protect that purchasing power, they're going to make decisions based on their wallets. And so I do think that's part of the explanation behind some of the trade numbers that we're seeing and perhaps this move uh, away from local in some sectors. And again, there are tons, tons of nuances in the report. I'm just trying to emphasize some of the major trends and things that apply overall, but there are plenty, plenty of nuances that I encourage you to go see in the report. On the next slide, just a couple more or just a few more uh, indicators to, uh, to, to point out. Uh, yes, we've had you know, food inflation that overall on average was almost 9% in 2022. That matches up with the index of food manufacturing prices that went up 10% or 10.2% in 2022. The bottom line is that it doesn't say anything about profitability. And as you'll see in a second or in just a few minutes, profitability or, or challenges when it comes to profitability in the food processing sectors were, were significant in 2022. Um, they were not as significant in 2022 for, for retailers. So the increase in prices that we've seen at food processors doesn't tell the whole story when it comes to profitability. I do think that profitability in 2022 is the main story. We'll talk about that in just a second. The other thing that uh, I was just saying that, you know, challenges in profitability were a big deal in 2022. Part of the reason is if you look at weekly employee earnings for food manufacturers, you know, the increase in 2022 was 10.6%. And that's way, way higher than the weekly employee earnings for all industries and the increase at 3.2%. So we are in an industry that's facing a lot of labor challenges. And those labor challenges, whether it's job vacancy rates that are high, retention that's difficult, all of those challenges actually show up in terms of higher wages and higher, and, and, and higher wage uh, and higher salaries. And, and, and there's just also some, some leftovers, I would say, from from 2020 and 2021, where we had to pay employees overtime because of the pandemic and so forth. So all of that, I think, is being captured in that measure. But I think it's one thing to point out is that we are in a part, in a sector of the overall economy uh, that faces a lot more significant labor pressures than, than the rest of the economy. And then third, and I did mention it you know, early on, the uh, disposable income in Canada went up 5.2%. That's a little bit lower than the overall rate of inflation, which was at you know 6.8%. If you look at the overall economy, and again, disposable income going up at a slower pace than inflation means that in real terms, consumers are losing purchasing power, and that leads to different behaviors. And even though we are likely to see inflation come down in 2023, the, the debt servicing cost for most Canadian households is going to go up. And I don't think that this is going to bring any type of relief, even if inflation's down. 
it's going to be a challenging year for consumers in 2023. The next slide, um, you're going to see the projections for food, food and beverage manufacturing sales in 2023. Uh, we are estimating uh, that sales are going to go up 2.2%. Before I say a few words about the number itself. I want to point out that for each of the sectors that you're going to, for each of the eight sectors that we feature in the report, you're going to see a chart similar to this. So that gives you an idea of the trend in manufacturing sales for the specific sector. At 2.2%, when we think of the increase in the value of shipments for food manufacturers and all beverage manufacturers, that might sound like, okay, but realizing that inflation is still going to be present, that doesn't leave a lot of room actually for growth in volume. So actually behind the forecast, there's a little bit of a decline in the volume sold by food manufacturers. And there's still a little bit of inflation captured in the forecast itself. Now, this forecast is heavily conditional on what happened towards the end of 2022. And we had a difficult Q4, right, for 2022, which is somewhat related to the forecast of 2.2% growth, which is something that is in line with what we had, a little bit lower than what we had in 2018-19. So yes, inflation's coming down, but that means as well that volumes are gonna be down slightly. Uh, I would say that if we do have a better Q1, and in fact, if you look at January sales in the industry, they've been a little bit better. Uh, and so to me, that suggests that, you know, this forecast that you see up on the screen is kind of a worst case scenario. Right? So it's a very, very conservative forecast, in my opinion. But I do think that it highlights some of the challenges we might see in the industry. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit about in more details what it looks like for, for the different sectors that uh, we look at in the report. Now, the next slide brings another chart, which I think is, is, is quite relevant for most businesses. And that's a chart on, the, on profitability. So this is the overall margin index for all food and beverage manufacturers. Now, there are tons of nuances in this. So you'll find a chart like this, and I'm not gonna be presenting it today, but you'll find a chart like this for each of the eight sectors with a trend of the recent years and a 23, 2023 forecast for each of the sectors. Um, and, and in reality, this, this the ironic thing I, I, I could say is, is that this, this chart that you see up on the screen is, is actually not necessarily illustrative of most sectors. In fact, it's an average. So under an average, you have sectors that are doing a little bit better and some sectors that are doing a little bit worse. In this case, you know, what we're seeing as an industry is what this, this, this chart suggests is that profit margins are gonna remain flat, basically. They're gonna grow a little bit, but by less than one than a percentage point. So that's not much to talk about. So really, I think the story is flat margin, slight rebound in 2023. Interestingly enough, if you actually look at each of the eight sectors, I would say that none of the sectors are actually in a situation like this. You have some sectors that did really well in 2022, and they're going to see their margins drop. But that's not a big deal because they did relatively well in 2022. And you have some sectors that were under a lot of pressure in 2022. And yes, they're going to rebound a little bit more than what you see up on the screen, but that they're still going to be in a situation where things are going to be quite challenging. But the one thing to me, aside from the forecast in 2023, the one thing to me that stands out in this is that we've never had, uh, as far as we can go back, and we only go back to 2018, but you can go back 20 years, this is the lowest point for food manufacturing margins over the last 20 years, right? So we look at gross margin as a share of gross revenues, and that we have the lowest margin point uh, of the last 20 years. And it's quite a bit of a decline from 2021 as well. So I do think that's quite, um, speaks quite well of what the situation has been for 2022, a challenging year when it comes to profitability, some inflation that shows up as yes, we, we sold, our sales went up, but um, it, it's, it's a matter of profitability. Uh, and, and the thing that we wanna do is to make, to take the time to look at what's gonna happen, what is likely to happen in 2023. So we'll talk on the next slide, we'll talk about, as I said, a brief overview of eight of the sectors that we feature in the report on the next slide. Um, this is a time for me to say that 
again, I have, um, there's just no time, no space. And frankly, I don't have all numbers in my head because there are just tons of those numbers and statistics that are relevant for each of the sectors. So again, this is just the, the time of the program where I can, again, uh, remind you to go back to the website, download a copy of the report and hopefully uh, find what, uh, what you need for. All right, let's dive in in some of the sectors in, in, in roughly 15 minutes here. So the next slide will bring up um, grain and oilseed milling. And it's been a good year for grain and oilseed milling, right? Good uh, raw prices. If you look at raw material prices, if you think of grains, oilseeds, they went up but because demand was so strong. I mean, most uh, at the, at the, uh, for food processors, grain and oilseed milling or millers, it's been um, possible to pass on some of the higher cost of production in, in terms of products being sold, right? So grocery volumes decline in 2022, but again, within the sector, there are some product categories, flour being one of them that I've seen actually growth in volume sold in groceries. So uh, you have to be careful about that, yet not again to generalize lots of nuances within the sector as well. Um, I'm talking about the price of raw material, if you look at grains and oil seeds, of course, the grain, uh, the war in Ukraine, a big driver of some of the higher prices that we've seen. Mandates for biodiesel, renewable diesel in the US and elsewhere in the world have driven up oil seed prices, uh, vegetable oil prices, and so forth. We've seen early in 2023, 2023, sorry, we've seen those prices decline somewhat, right? Off the highs that, certainly off the highs that we uh, recorded in the first uh, six months of 2022, but even lower than what uh, the average price for the second half of 2022 has been. So um, we, we, we think that, you know, in this case, because of raw material prices or raw product prices declining, we think that those margins are going to improve actually. That yes, you know, there's been quite a bit of inflation that, but margins have been good, not great. But in 2023, we could see a little bit of an improvement when it comes to margins, because again, those raw product prices are going to be declining with, again, uh, supply catching up to demand worldwide. And, and this is really an industry that's, that's, that's really evolving in a global marketplace. So of course, uh, subject to influences when it comes to supply of grains and oil seeds available in the world. Of course, you know, we're early in 2023, a little bit too early to to say anything really about the size of the crops in North America, but we know that Brazil is going to bring a big crop into the market. It was brought a big, is bringing a big crop in the market. We know that the Russian wheat crop is, is, is large, very large. We have an agreement now between Russia, at least for the next so many days. Uh, we'll see how that gets renewed and so forth between Russia, Ukraine, and the United Nations. So all of that, I think, is going to lead to some lower raw product prices. And so I think that I do think that this is going to help on the margin side. On the next slide, we're going to be talking about sugar and confectionery products. Um, some gains in 2022 that was really fueled by the rebound in food services. Um, so I think that was a positive development for the industry. I think this is an industry where um, a couple of different trends that matter, right? So if you look at different products, I would say that overall, those the volumes uh, at the grocery level have been declining in 2022. But of course, again, you know, lots of nuances to think about. If you look at chocolate products being top 10 in terms of volume growth at the grocery level. So some products therein have been actually benefiting from, from strong sales at the grocery level, sales from at the, in the food service sector as well that have been rebounding. So uh, overall though, grocery volumes decline 1%. So it really depends. But one thing that I would say that is, is subject to, to, to monitoring in 2023 is really the, the response of consumers to high price products within that sector, right? So I would expect that given the nature of the products that those, those higher price points, those products that are at a higher price points, perhaps going to be subject to some demand pressures. And so this is one thing to, to monitor. Of course, health trends are not gonna go away, but as, as Canadians have been moving towards healthier eating and so forth, I think there's also an indulgence component to uh, food consumption behaviors. And, and if uh, we do have uh, a more challenging economic environment in 2023, as we expect, then maybe that indulgence actually becomes a, a selling feature, so to speak. And, and, and we might see a little bit of benefits to this. Okay, on the next slide now, we just briefly saw it on the way. Right? So this is fruit, vegetable processing, and specialty food sales. A lot of 
um, different product categories within the sector. We're talking about frozen entries, frozen pizza, French fries, soups, canned uh, vegetables, fruits, and so forth. So a very, um, very diverse sector. There's been definitely a push towards more preserved food away from fresh. If you think that fresh overall, again, generally speaking, is a little bit at a higher price point. So I think that's been to the benefit of the sector. There's also been some some nice and, and some 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 rewarding initiatives when it comes to the health um, trend that we've been just talking about. So I do think that as well, this this uh, sector has benefited from this. Um, volume growth improve uh, throughout the year, but we do think that the margins are going to be declining uh, suddenly early in the year. And one of the things that I did not spend too much time talking about is the impact of the value of the Canadian dollar on overall profitability, right? So if we do think that there's going to be a slowdown, not only in Canada, but in the global economy, that would mean that commodity prices, if you think of energy, for example, are likely to be lower uh, in the short to midterm, perhaps rebound towards the end of the year. And if that's the case, we do expect lower Canadian dollar. There's also that flight to safety towards the US dollar. Usually when we have some sort of economic slowdown that would actually bring pressure on the Canadian dollar. And as the Canadian dollar uh, heads lower or is lower in value, then perhaps we see, you know, in some very specific sector, a little bit of a bigger impact when it comes to margins, right? So the price of those raw products will are tied a little bit more to the Canadian dollar and with the Canadian dollar coming down in the first six months, um, that might drive margins a little bit lower and that might have a rebound in the second half of the year. Now onto dairy on the next slide. The dairy sector has seen a uh, you know, quite a bit of growth when it comes to food manufacturing sales. And that's mostly the result of fluid milk and, and butter um, sales, you know, the grocery level. But despite all, and that's that's a result of prices for the milk components going up and being able to pass on some of those higher prices up to, to consumers. Uh, but nonetheless, despite this inflation in dairy products, I do think that we have some categories within the dairy industry that are showing some good demand, some strength in demand. I mean, Creamers is one, ice cream, cheese, infant formula has been very strong as well. We do have growth projected. I mean, we still think that demand is going to grow. I think there's, there's been no sign of demand slowing down. Well, there's been some signs, but overall, I do think that the demand for dairy products has been quite resilient, despite some of the inflation that we've seen in the industry. I do you think that gross margins short term are projected to decline slightly. Again, a rebound for that second half of the year, especially given that we think that there is not going to be any more inflation when it comes to cost of production at the farm level and milk component prices being tied to the cost of production at the farm level and hoping that those grain prices, feed prices and so forth being lower throughout 2023 are not gonna trigger any type of increase in the milk price paid by processors. And so from that standpoint, we do think that there's cost control here, uh, especially showing up in margins in the second half of 2023. The one thing I'm gonna emphasize here, and, and this is really interesting in the dairy manufacturing industry. If you look at, I'm looking at my notes just to make sure I got the numbers right. But if you look at the value add in the sector, per dollar wages, it went up 14% in 2022. So yes, there's a little bit of inflation behind this, but there's no doubt in my mind that that um, that's really the, the result of efficiency gains for dairy manufacturers. So faced with labor shortages, lots of pressures that we've, as we've discussed on wages in the industry, we've seen a lot of food manufacturing sectors I try to bring on efficiency gains. And I think it shows up really, really clearly in the data for, for dairy manufacturers. So something to, to notice, I mean, it's happening as well across other sectors, but we did notice it a little bit more in, um, in the dairy manufacturing, dairy manufacturing sector. Moving on to the next sector, which is meat products. Now, this is a sector exposed to definitely trends in the domestic market as well as the export markets. Um, if you look at domestic market, I think, you know, for the most part, we would see growth being tied to population growth. Because if you think, especially red meat, for example, it's historically been a, a product that's quite sensitive 
to the economic context and the economic environment, right? So with high inflation, although inflation right now, if you look at beef, pork, it's much, much lower than overall inflation. Uh, but historically, this is where consumers have been a little bit more sensitive. So I expect consumers to shift to move towards you know, lower price meat cuts, for example. Um, when it comes to profitability, it was mixed in 2022. I mean, if you, if you look at some of the increases in livestock prices well, or, or chicken prices, for example, up 11% in 2022, cattle prices up 16%. Uh, hog prices been up 7% in 2022, 29% in 2021. So overall, that brought quite a bit of pressures on margins or, of meat manufacturers. Unfortunately, this is not looking to ease anytime soon. I mean, maybe in the chicken industry where we've seen feed prices come down, then perhaps that can spell a little bit of relief when it comes to live chicken prices. But if you look at hogs and, and, and well, cattle certainly, with the reduction in the herd in the U.S., no appetite for expansion just yet. I mean, we're expecting cattle prices to stay elevated for most of 2023, and that should actually um, speak to maybe uh, margins that are slightly declining in 2023. Now, on the export side of things, this is a real, an industry that's quite exposed to fluctuation in the export markets, um, and there are just lots of uncertainty, right? There are tensions going on in Asia, tensions going on in, in of course, in, in Ukraine and, and so forth. But if you think, for example, the Chinese economy and pork and that pork demand, well, at the early, early this year, we thought, well, the numbers that are coming out of China when it comes to pork production actually suggest that the worst is over when it comes to African swine fever, that they've been able to rebuild uh, production so that they can meet this growing demand for pork meat, you know, pork being by far the most favored and preferred protein in China. But so that was at the beginning of 2023. Lately, when we saw prices, what we've seen prices go down quite significantly in China, it suggests that actually African twine fever is not over. And they have had some sort of resurgence in the number of cases that they've had. And now we're talking about potentially production falling by 10% in China. So that can open up, you know, short term, there's plenty of meat as we're bringing those animals at the market, and that's what's behind the decline in prices that, that we've seen in China. But perhaps towards the end of, of this year, it might open up a little bit of opportunity for meat exporters in Canada, perhaps can be one of those uh, exporters that can benefit from that gap in demand if indeed, you know, the, uh, the, the market is such that production over there is not as great as, as it was in 2022. But overall, the global economic outlook is murky a little bit. And so let's not forget that Consumers sometimes are sensitive to, to, to income. And if income in the world is not going up at projected pace, then perhaps that can actually lead to a little bit weaker opportunities for meat exporters in Canada. On the next uh, slide, I want to talk about seafood preparation or seafood product industry. This is an industry that is quite uh, tied to available supply, right? So if we have challenges when it comes to production of the raw product, this is going to feed into the entire supply chain. And indeed, you know, 2022 was a challenging year. We had a plant, a salmon plant, um, shutting down in, in, in the, on the West Coast. We've had, you know, Hurricane Fiona in Atlantic Canada creating some, some disruptions quite significantly for some, some processing plants. So overall, a, a, a little bit of a disappointing year when you look at the overall sales of, of seafood uh, manufacturers. And, and, um, and given that, you know, we were in an inflationary environment, um, we're projecting sales to pick up in the summer and into next year. So I think that's the good thing. I mean, obviously, the, the, the fate of, of the sector is also tied to whatever supplies come in uh, to market. Uh, there are lots of uncertainty in some, some areas of the country in terms of the availability to expand production with, because of regulations and so forth. So this is going to be something to monitor for sure. But if you look at the index of raw product prices for fish, seafood, uh, it's down. So we do think that if we're able to bring products to market, bring products to manufacturers, that you know, there's going to be volume there and that those margins should be better in 2023 than they've been in 2022, which should actually bring a little bit of relief to, to seafood manufacturers. And on the next slide, 
last but not, oh, sorry, two more, uh, not exactly the last one. Bakery, the bakery sector has done really well. Uh, it's last year, it's one of the sectors that has recorded as a sector, the effect, in fact, the only sector that has recorded growth in groceries. So I think it's positive. Now margins were challenged, right? Because of, again, high raw material costs. And you can think of anything from flour to grain prices and so forth, but it's also packaging costs. Labor costs went up 18% year over year for the industry. So some challenges for sure. A lot of businesses are looking to automate so forth, which are good things. Um, but but I think that you know margins could be improving again with raw product prices coming down in certainly in the second half of 2023. Already, I think we've started to see some of that. So I do think that's something that um, we're going to uh, categorize as a good thing for, for, for bakeries, especially given that we think that demand is going to remain very solid and robust going forward in 2023. So good demand, strong demand with margins that are going to be improving. So I do think that the outlook is positive for the bakery sector. And finally, but not least, the beverage uh, manufacturer sector. This is an industry, again, that's so diverse. Right? We got uh, soft drinks, carbonated water, alcoholic beverages, such as wine, beer, uh, liquor and um and just lots of different nuances right so soft drinks recorded quite a bit of an increase in sales but if you look at alcoholic sales of manufacturers it's been down so you know if you look at for example non-alcoholic imitations of alcoholic beverages that's been a category that's been doing well so there's just lots of different things going on in the industry I do you think when it comes to alcoholic beverages um the economic context matters if we're seeing a little bit more uh, of a challenging economic environment in 2023, we'll see consumers not abandon the category, but certainly move towards lower price products. So that's one thing. Second is that it's been a really challenging year for, for certainly for distilleries, breweries, and so forth when it comes to margins. And we're seeing a little bit of a rebound because raw material prices are going to be declining, but it's 2020 was so challenging that the rebound is going to be there but it's coming off a low base, right? So I think it's something for, for businesses to continue to investigate, looking for efficiencies and so forth, seeing like how can they control costs and so forth? Because I don't think those profitability pressures, given the nature of competition in the industry, especially when I, I refer to the, the competition in the alcoholic beverages uh, sector, uh, that's really one thing to, to monitor for uh, the sector. So that was this. Um, Oh, that was it. That's it. Uh, this, as I said, uh, on the next slide, you know, please go uh, and to our website. I think you'll find tons of information uh, on, on the industry. On the next slide, please. And if you want, on the next slide, if you want some economic information relevant for your business, you can go to fcc.ca slash economics. And again, it's not, uh, you'll have the food report available for sure, but you'll also find some other information related to the, the broader economy and some of the specific sectors across the entire supply chain. So Darlene, I'll turn it over back to you so that we can see if we have a few questions to, to answer. Great. Well, thanks, JP. That was a fantastic overview of the economic situation today and really how it's impacting the different subsectors of the food and beverage industry. And I'm sure that people that are on the call today will really have some good takeaways to apply them to their businesses at home. So thanks for that. Um, we do have a few questions and um, I have one here um, written down here. So I'd really like to understand JP, um, how you see global economic growth for 2022, uh, 2023, pardon me. And what do you expect for uh, demand for exports around um, food products um, going forward in the near future? Yeah, I alluded to this a little briefly in, in, in my remarks and we can expand on this a little bit, right? So short term, I do think that we have to acknowledge there are gonna be some challenges, right? The global economy is gonna be slowing down. At the very beginning of 2023, if you look at those international organizations that are tasked with forecasting what the economic outlook looks like for the world, the IMF, OECD, and so forth, they were actually quite optimistic. They did revise upward their projection for the world economy, but that was at the early, early part of the year. I think now when those that, that next set of, of forecasts is going to be released, I do think that we're going to see a little bit of a revision downward. 
Um, fact is, a lot of the central banks in the Western economy anyway, the Western world, has lifted interest rates. That's just going to slow down consumer spending. Uh, yes, you know, there are a few people enthusiastic and optimistic about China that moved away from that COVID zero policy, so forth. So that's going to trigger a lot of economic activity and, and, and they'll have a rebound and so forth. Yes. And there are also a lot of challenges in, in the Chinese economy. The real estate market is in trouble. Um, they carry a lot of debt, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, overall, I do think that we have to acknowledge that short term, those export opportunities, because from a demand standpoint, one of the things that we tend to forget is that those consumers in developing countries, well, the income goes down, they are a little bit more um, sensitive to that than, let's say, for the average Canadian, which will still consume some food, right? The average Canadian will shift the food basket or purchasing decisions within the food basket, but will not necessarily um, uh, scale back the purchases, whereas, you know, at the, in the international market, you'll see some of that. So short term, you know, I, I do think that we have to acknowledge we will likely to meet some challenges. Midterm and long term, I think, you know, we have, we're in a really good spot to, to, to feed the world, solve some of food insecurity issues that are going on across the world. As I said, there are some food insecurity issues going on in our country as well. But I mean, there are tons of food insecurity issues that are going on with the world. I think Canada is in a really great position to sell more food to the entire world. I think that's midterm and short term, uh, sorry, midterm and long term, short term, we might have to, to, to face a, a few headwinds to begin with. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, you spoke about your in, in your presentation about the ongoing labor challenges that we're facing in the food and beverage industry and agriculture overall. And we often discuss the need to bring automation to the food processing plants um, so that we can, you know, uh, face some of these labor shortages in our industry. And with everything going on, we're talking about inflation, high interest rates, potentially maybe a recession moving forward. Do you think it's an appropriate um, investment climate for food and beverage manufacturers to want to invest in automation at this time? No, oh, this is this is a really good question. I, I think we need to take a, a, a short term and long term view. Right, Short term, we have labor shortages the thing is, as well, we have to acknowledge that long term, these labor shortages are not going to go away. I'm talking next 10 years. Um, if you look at the entire supply chain, if you start from the farm sector to food processing, to retail, to food services, to trucking, that's an industry connected, that's critical to our the success of the entire food supply chain. All of these industries are faced with job vacancy rates. More looking for more workers than 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 other sectors of the economy, right? So on average, we have job vacancy rates in, in the supply, the food supply chain higher than, than everywhere else. So, and those things, you know, projections are not necessarily kind to that job vacancy rate statistic. I mean, we're still going to face some some significant shortages. Um, Immigration is probably going to be one of the fixes that we uh, we look at as a country, but you know, it, there are some issues as well when it comes to the ability, capacity, and so forth. Um, so all of that to say that I think it's a good time to start, you know, thinking about investing if you have not done yet. Um, so it, yes, interest rates are, are are higher, but actually with the events of the last couple of weeks, we've seen bond yields for five-year money come down. So that might be an opportunity for some businesses to, to look at some things here. Um, I think that short term, there are some challenges, but long term, the demand outlook is extremely positive and we have a long term issue to solve as well in terms of overall productivity and the need to invest. So not an easy task for sure in the current context, as you clearly laid out. But nonetheless, I think very critical to the long-term success of the industry, right? So those businesses that are able to invest and automate as much as they can are probably going to be the ones looking at success down the road, is what I would say. Mm, great. Um, what's your current assessment of global supply chains? Are we back to normal situations? Um, I'd say the short answer is yes, but with a cav big caveat though. So if, if you look at, you know, Supply chain, global supply chain is such a large 
era, uh, area to look at, right? But one of the statistics I like to look at is the Federal Reserve in New York statistic when it comes to pressures on global supply chain. And their index is back to where it was prior to the pandemic. So globally, on average, those supply chains are back to normal. Now, of course, you'll see, depending on the mode of transport, depending on the sector and so forth, you're going to see some supply chains that are face, still facing a little bit of pressure. But overall, I'd say those global supply chains are back to normal. It's when you bring the, the supply chains into the country that perhaps we still have some work to do, right? So I have reports and I've heard from, from food processors of, of, hey, we're missing some parts. We bought, we ordered some equipment, we implemented introduce the equipment in the plant, uh, and, and we're still missing some parts, we're still missing servicing, we're still missing a few things. And so I do think that from that standpoint, it's going to be a little bit more time before we can say, yeah, you know what, those global chains are, those global supply chains are back to normal. And they also are back to normal within our own economy and our own sector. But I think it's probably a, a six month time frame uh, for which we could say perhaps at the end of the six months, hey, yes, we're back to normal in, in some ways, right? So uh, transportation is critical as well, but with the energy costs coming down, I think that can actually help resolve some of the transportation issues going forward and so forth. So I'm fairly optimistic that we can put those supply chain issues in the rear view mirror uh, relatively soon. Great, that sounds like some good news around that. So thanks for that. Uh, JP, this is all the time we have for today. Um, so I do want to once again, thank you for being with us. And, and I want to thank all of our guests that have joined the event today. It has been very uh, informative and, and um, I hope that uh, everybody got some good out of uh, JP's uh, commentary on the food and beverage report. So you will be receiving in a few days an email with the link to the recording of today's presentation so that you can rewatch it and share it with others. And you'll also have the link to the actual 2023 FCC food and beverage report that JP spoke to today. There will be an evaluation form that should just take a few minutes to complete and we really would appreciate that you do so as it helps us develop and improve uh, our events like uh, this one today. And if you want to learn more about any upcoming events that we're working on or to access uh, any more information on food and beverage content, as JP mentioned, you can visit our website at www.fcc.ca slash economics. And with that, and on behalf of all of our staff here at FCC, I want to thank you all once again for joining us and we wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Be well, everyone.